Hey, this is just a quick note about our sponsor, Pravado, the premier enterprise privacy platform, purpose-built to bridge the gap between privacy and engineering. Its privacy code scanning solution embeds privacy compliance and governance into the product development lifecycle and empowers privacy and security teams with unparalleled visibility of sensitive data flows and the insights to find and fix privacy vulnerabilities. You can leverage Provado's data flows, dynamic data mapping, privacy assessment automation, and real-time visibility of privacy issues. Enter the era of proactive privacy and transform privacy from business blocker to business enabler. To learn more, go to provado.ai. The idea would be to build these privacy profiles according to like longitudinal study so that you will have your uh, predefined profile, like your privacy pragmatic or privacy guardian, for instance. And according to that, you will have predefined choices about your privacy decisions. So it's always about like empowering people, about like supporting their decision by providing like better and informed notices, for instance. And then we will combine it with another kind of automation with like on the fly privacy permission so that people are not burdened too much with the decisions, but only when needed, when required. We we're trying to like design it to solve this tension, basically, between usability and lawfulness in this kind of environment. Welcome, everyone, to Shifting Privacy Left. I'm your host and resident privacy guru, Deborah J. Farber. Today, I'm delighted to welcome my next two guests, Victor Morel and Simone Fisher-Hubner, who will be discussing their recent paper, Automating Privacy Decisions, Where to Draw the Line, where they outline the main challenges raised by the automation of privacy decisions and provide a classification scheme that addresses those challenges. Simone Fischer-Hubner has been a full professor at Karlstad University since June 2000, where she is the head of the Privacy and Security, or PRISAC, research group. She received her undergraduate degree, PhD, and habilitation degree in computer science from Hamburg University. Impressively, Chalmers University of Technology awarded Simone with an honorary doctorate two years ago, where she is now a visiting professor. Simone has been conducting research in privacy, cybersecurity, and privacy-enhancing technologies for more than 30 years. I can't list all of her many accomplishments and projects right now, but I will highlight a few recent ones. She's the Swedish representative of the International Federation for Information Processing, a board member of the Swedish Data Protection Forum, and member of the board for the Privacy Enhancing Technology Symposia, otherwise known as PETS. Victor Morel holds a PhD in computer science from INSA de Leon in RIA on the Privatix research team. His research interests include privacy and data protection, network security, usability and human computer interactions, applied cryptography, and technology ethics. Victor is currently working in the security and privacy lab at Chalmers University of Technology on usable privacy for IoT applications. And in addition to his academic activities, he also volunteers his time to educate others by advocating for decentralization, privacy, and free software. (laughs) Welcome, Victor and Simone. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Deborah, for uh, inviting us. Yeah, delighted to have you here. So what motivated you both to focus your research on the automation of privacy decisions? So our ultimate goal is to design privacy decisions that are usable, where users are well informed, and do decisions that also match their preferences. However, in practice, this is always a challenge because users are overwhelmed with lots of privacy decision consent requests, cookies, so that they barely have time to read through privacy policies and make well-informed decisions. So the question is whether privacy decisions can be supported through automation. For instance, that systems can be supported by machine learning, predict the users, 
privacy decisions and make recommendations or help users to set these decisions. However, there are many legal questions as we probably later will discuss and the further challenges. So maybe, Victor, you want to compliment? Yeah, it all boils down to uh, this uh, cyber security research project that we're uh, conducting uh, together with uh, other people in Sweden. And we wanted to build a privacy system that will manage these uh, privacy permissions. But we were not sure about how we could automate these privacy decisions. And so we started to like dig a little bit, ask some questions to lawyers, people working in data protection agencies. And eventually we realized that no one really knew. And so all of our findings could actually result in a research paper. So this is also why we have this article now, because we had to provide the answers ourselves in a way. That makes sense. So it's the initial research for the next step of you building something that you wanted to build in a privacy preserving way yeah. or this privacy assistant capability. It also brings up that there is a regulatory perspective here. What did you learn as your requirements for building this out when you were speaking to the attorneys? Like if you could summarize the relevant European legal rules like GDPR and e-privacy that are relevant for privacy decision-making and automation, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah. So the GDPR like specifies a few uh, requirements, notably for consent, because consent is one of the type of privacy decision that we uh, deal with in our paper. So it states that consent has to be informed, specific, freely given, and ambiguous, and also that it entails a clear statement and affirmative action basically means that you can't just like fully automate consent. This is like one important requirement. It also says that you have to um, provide the possibility to withdraw consent and it should be as easy to withdraw as it is to give. It also like uh, specify a few things when it comes to explicit consent. For instance, you have to uh, ask for an explicit consent, so like a stronger version of it when you deal with sensitive data, so philosophical uh, data about religion, etc., etc. When you want to automate a decision for profiling, for instance, and also when you have to transfer data to countries without adequate safeguards which still nowadays include the US because of the SRAMS 2 court case that invalidated privacy transfer agreements between the EU and the US. So it's needed for so-called third countries that transfers to countries outside the EU. The GDPR actually includes further requirements that are important in regard to automating privacy decisions. For instance, the principle of privacy by design and default. So by default, the most privacy-friendly installation settings should be installed. So this also has impact on how far we can automate privacy decisions. Yeah, then there are also um, further rights to object, for instance, to opt out, the right to object to direct marketing and profiling. And then in addition to the GDPR, we also have the e-privacy directive, which is now under discussion to be replaced by e-privacy regulations. So the directive is governing the electronic communications sector. So it is more specific than the GDPR. And in particular, it also regulates cookies or tracking and technologies. And here also requires consent by the data subjects. So this has led to all the cookie banners and consent requests that we are confronted with daily. So here the privacy or e-privacy directive or in future regulation also plays an important role. Thank you for that. I think both of you really helped give kind of a summary of, I guess we call them like the regulatory requirements that you that were constraints for as you're building out this classification schema from your paper, your approach to this research seems to be along two dimensions for the classification scheme. The first is the type of privacy decisions that you categorize. And then the second is their level of automation, whether it's manual, semi-automated, and automated. 
Since your focus here seems to be a user's ability to control disclosure of their personal data and the conditions for that processing of that data, can you elaborate on this approach and your research? Yeah, our focus is notably on the user's ability to control their personal data, but it's also about usability because we want to provide like meaningful control. And there might be a tension between the usability and the lawfulness, like, and the, uh, between the two. So we're trying to like clarify the terms of the debate here, which turned out to be not so easy. We first started to like look at consent. And this is also why we have such a focus on our paper and then realized that not everything is just about consent. They're like privacy um, permissions, privacy preferences and. When you like withdraw consent or when you opt out of data collection in a way, it's not exactly consent. It doesn't like call for the same legal requirements. It's about control and it's about uh, usability in a way. Simone, maybe you want to add something? Yes, we elaborated um, decisions which are related to consent and the controlling the disclosure and processing of personal data. And uh, here, of course, privacy permissions are also important decisions. So we are also confronted when we are installing apps, for instance, on mobile phones to set privacy permissions. So this could be combined with the consent, but there can be also legal, other legal grounds for privacy permissions. For instance, uh, the legal basis of a contract for an e-banking app. So there might be an overlap with consent, but it might be also some, not be based on consent. So privacy permission settings is another type of privacy decisions. Then there might be also privacy preferences settings, which are different to privacy permission settings because a privacy preference we defined rather as an indication of privacy choices, but it's only indicating the preferences of a user without the privacy permissions set, like privacy permissions are more like access control rule settings and privacy preferences are just the wishes or indications of what the user's wishes. And there are also different tools for indicating privacy preferences that have been developed in the past and currently um, so-called privacy preference languages, for instance, like in the past, P3P, the platform for privacy preferences, where users could also indicate their preferences. And then you have a website that states the privacy policies, so both the privacy preferences and the privacy policies of the websites are stated in machine-readable format, and then they can be matched so that you can automatically detect how far the user's preferences matches with a website's policy and any deviations could then be very noticeably displayed to the end user to uh, contribute to usable transparency so that uh, the user doesn't have to read the whole privacy policy statement but just get very noticeably the deviations of his preference, his or her preferences from the site's policy displayed. So these are privacy preference settings. So it's another type of decision in addition to consent and privacy permission settings. And then, as Victor said, the decisions to re reject consent or to revoke consent or to object. So these are also another type of privacy decisions that we can make. Yeah. And so th that's really helpful. And thank you for giving us some illustrative examples. Just to sum it up, I think for the audience here that there are four different types of privacy decisions that your paper talks about. Privacy permissions, privacy preference settings, consents to processing and rejection of processing. Is that correct? Yes. Awesome. Did you have anything to add to that, Victor? Yeah, no, I just had like a few examples in mind, like for instance, mobile app permissions are like a good example of uh, what privacy permissions can be. This is like something we're confronted to every day, basically. And typically on Android, you can be asked uh, to like uh, regulate which data will be accessed by which app. And this is like a typical example of a privacy permission, which unlike a privacy preference has to be enforced. I mean, it's like a binding decision. 
So, for instance, a privacy preference will be just something that you will indicate but might not necessarily be taken into account by your system. I think one old now example is DNT, which stands for Do Not Track. I think you mentioned it in a previous episode. So, well, people were able to like define their preference. So I want to be tracked or not. But website could also choose not to take that into account. And this is the main difference between like uh, privacy permissions and privacy preferences. One is binding and the other one is not. And then we also like dig into consent. So like, yeah, cookie banners are a good example, but we also interested in that like IoT settings, because I think it's going to be a big thing at some point that you will have to deal with the disclosure of your data in a legal way, which is like the main thing about consent. It has like a direct legal implication. And also like what we call under this umbrella term, reject. So yeah, opting out. Interestingly, for instance, GPC, which is enforced in the US by the CCPA in California, is a good example of a reject decision because it's an opt out. So we can't really say that it's about consent. Consent is more of an opt in and has like a very clear and precise definition, at least in the EU. And GPC will not be considered as consent under our framework for a good reason, but GPC will be, yes, considered as like a reject because it's like an opt-out decision. So just a few examples to uh, maybe give the audience uh, a feeling of uh, what we're talking about. It's not just like academic work, even though we are also interested in like research projects in the, in the, in the EU, the US, etc. but there are also like uh, concrete things that we're discussing in the paper. Absolutely. I'll add a link to the paper in the show notes so that folks can go ahead and read that. It's not too long. It's like a you know, it's only nine pages, but it's got a lot of really great info in there. In fact, you evaluate each type of privacy decision and then the implications of various levels of automation on those decisions. So manual, semi-automated and fully automated. Please tell us about some of your findings when it comes to these different levels of automation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello, loyal listeners. The Shifting Privacy Left podcast is seeking sponsors who want to help educate our growing community of privacy engineers. Position your brand in front of privacy engineers, architects, developers, researchers, and privacy tech buyers. Insert a 30 to 60 second ad like this one into every published episode of the podcast. This is dynamic content after all. Feature your new product, an upcoming conference, a sponsored special deal, endless opportunities. Email sponsorship at shiftingprivacyleft.com for more information on our sponsorship package. Okay, let's get back to our engaging privacy conversation. So manual decisions, uh, yeah, do not raise any legal issues. They are quite straightforward. That is what we anyhow do every day. However, of course, there are usability challenges as discussed, because doing all the settings, permission settings, or giving consent always manually requires a high cognitive load from the user and a lot of time. There has been also research that just reading all the privacy policies will take several days a year, so users simply do not have the time to really read all the policies to do well-informed decisions. So in summary, manual decisions are legally, do not raise any legal issues, however, usability issues. Semi-automated decisions are those where decisions are made at one time upon dynamically created requests or reacting on dynamically created recommendations. So here, Recently, a lot of research has been done on so-called personalized privacy assistance that with machine learning support can predict the user's privacy preferences and then can dynamically suggest changes to permissions so that the permission settings are fitting to their real preferences. So the user is somehow nudged in a way to change the permission settings. So this can also raise some ethical issues 
because privacy nudges, even so it follows a positive intention, can also impact the user's autonomy and could manipulate the user. So there are also some discussions around ethical aspects. However, still, they can help users to make decisions that are better matching their preferences and also simplify making decisions. So they have surely advantages for usability. Uh, when it comes to consent, there has been also work on dynamic consent, where consent is evoked in case that, for instance, purposes for data processing are changes, or if a context appears that the data becomes sensitive, so-called special categories of data and pursuant to the GDPR, for instance, location data, yeah, about the current location of the user can indicate that the user is visiting a hospital or a church, so the data becomes medical data or data related to religious beliefs, and then you might want, yeah, or then actually for special categories of data, explicit consent is required, so this could be evoked, or consent requests could be evoked dynamically, yeah, so we could also have dynamic consent as a form of semi-automated decision-making. Yeah, so there are different forms for semi-automation. And then finally, we have full automation of privacy decisions. But here, our findings are also that they mostly conflict with the GDPR because for consent, you need uh, an affirmative action. So consent cannot be given automatically. And also for privacy permission and privacy preference settings, if they are set automatically, they might contradict with default settings um, that implement privacy by default. So they might change the privacy by default settings in a way that they are more generously allowing data processing. So they are not the most privacy-friendly option. So here we have then a conflict with Article 25 of the GDPR, the principle of privacy by default. So our conclusion was also that actually for automated decision-making, this only works for the decision to reject. So that means, for instance, for revoking consent, for opting out. So this can be done automatically in line with the GDPR, but all other decisions are problematic to be done automatically. That's a really good summary of the research. Do you have anything to add to that, Victor? Yeah, about the full automation of privacy decisions, it uh, surprisingly connects to uh, another paper we recently published with uh, Piero Romare and uh, Farzane Karagar, still in the same uh, project, the Cybersec IT project. We were interested in what were the preferences and concern of users about a certain type of environment, uh, IoT trigger action platforms such as IFTTT, which provides like applets to basically automate some of your decisions. So like you would like your IoT device to connect with your cloud service, etc. And people were not really happy about full automation of their personal data. So they were interested by the automation aspect, but they still wanted to be in control. So there are the legal requirements, but there are also expectations of everyday people. And basically, people want to stay in the loop. They want to have like uh, some facilitation in their uh, decision making, but they don't want to be left out. So it's interesting to see that like it is actually also a thing from a user usability point of view that yeah, people want to, to uh, be helped with their decision. Yeah, they want to feel in control in a way. This is something I wanted to add, yeah. Yeah, and indeed, and indeed there is also research from the US in this proposals to automate consent or permission settings, but um, they also refer to research by others that have shown that users would like to stay in control. And yeah, so there are technologies proposed for fully automating consent or other decisions, but especially from the United States, but in the European context, yeah, you can question whether yeah, this is legal in reference to the GDPR. 
From a socio-technical perspective, I think it's fascinating because it's almost like a sense of a bigger idea of, of autonomy, of we don't want people making decisions about us. We want to understand how decisions are made. And Research has shown that with 95% prediction, you can predict um, the privacy preferences of a user. So automation properly can work very well. And there's also research that if you have automation, um, the result will probably be that you have privacy permission settings that are better meeting your privacy preferences than if you let the user make the decision under the circumstances that he or she usually does not have the time and dedication to really make well-informed decision. However, I understand uh, 95% sounds very good, but there are also 5% where there are deviations in the system besides something automatically that you do not agree to. So you will be very unhappy. So I can also see that users still would like to have control. Right. So based on your findings at a high level, which conditions enable the automation of privacy decisions while complying with regulations? And which ones are just like, we should never use these because they'll never comply? Is it just full automation? Is that already the answer? Or do you have something else to add there? Yeah, fully automation, except for the decision type reject. So when you reject to give consent, revoke concept, opt out, so that can be done fully automatically and still comply with the GDPR. Oh, that's a really good call out. Yeah, and actually the GDPR even mentioned that it could be interesting to uh, exercise your right to object to uh, like profiling, for instance, using automated means. So it kind of goes in our direction that it should be possible to like fully automate the withdrawal of consent, opting out and everything like this. But this is basically the only use case. And this is also why we created this weird category reject in which we include like opt out, withdrawal and right to object. Mm -hmm. Because this is the only way, this is only good use case in which it, it is interesting to fully automate the decision in that case. And also because you don't disclose any data, mm -hmm. you only prevent the disclosure of data. So it's like a negative definition in that very specific case. Yeah, so the GDPR yeah. only regulates how you have to give consent, but not how to yeah reject consent. <laughs> and actually, there are also several tools for automating rejects, like consent omatic, right? That rejects cookies by default. Yeah, yeah. we found indeed a few uh, extensions for uh, web browsers that will help with uh, decisions with cookie banners. And some are arguably not compliant with the GDPR because they will consent on your behalf and this is not okay. But some will take a more uh, privacy preserving approach and will only like dismiss basically the, uh, the cookie banners, such as Consentomatic, which has been uh, designed by uh, colleagues in Denmark. And this like a web extension will just look for uh, all of the cookie banners and will dismiss everything. So this is actually fine to do so, even in a fully automated way, because you won't disclose any data to the website. Oh, that's fascinating. So to what extent can automated privacy decisions promote informed control in line with the GDPR to benefit of users? I guess what I'm asking for here is best practices for informed control. What would you recommend? I think an interesting line would be to provide uh, tailored recommendations. So this is a form of automation in a way because you basically like feed some uh, some data, but you don't take decisions on behalf of uh, of users. You just help them to make an informed decisions. So I, we think it's a it's an interesting way. It fits typically in the semi automated category that we designed. We also surveyed some. Um, artificial agent that will provide an somehow automated negotiation of privacy decision. And it can be done in a way that you will never disclose data unknowingly. So this is also like a very interesting line of approach. And finally, we surveyed some work that will providing request on the fly. It's like also a form of, of automation, but maybe Simone, you can uh, say a few more words because you, you work on projects that involve the, this uh, on-the-fly uh, privacy decision. 
Yes, so this is basically also part of the semi-automated decision category. Yeah, so if, for instance, the user acts or makes decision which does not match his or her privacy preferences that were previously declared, then the user would be asked whether the user wants to anyhow give consent or reject consent. And then if the user decides at the same time, the user can be asked on the flight whether the user would now like to update his or her privacy and preference settings. So that we have done for privacy preference languages. And we um, also consider to implement that for privacy permission settings in the context of IoT trigger and action platforms that also here on the fly, the user can be asked to change permission settings. Yeah, for instance, in the context when dynamic consent is evoked, because there are grounds to require dynamic consent. So the user has previously given consent, but now the situation where dynamic consent is required, for instance, if the data suddenly becomes sensitive or as uh, Victor also elaborated, data is transferred outside of Europe, or if the data is used for profiling, then the GDPR requires dynamic consent. And in this context, the user can also be asked whether, depending on how the user answers, whether the permission should be changed accordingly. So they are set on the fly. So then the user does not need to be bothered uh, constantly with um, setting permissions, but um, the user can start with privacy by default permission settings, which are then updated on the fly. Yeah, that means and the user is asked whether the settings should be changed in the context when the user is anyhow asked to make decisions. That makes sense. So in your paper and here, we're, we're talking about privacy decisions and automation across three separate technologies, right? Web, mobile, and IoT. How should organizations think about achieving usable and transparent privacy with automation across technologies? through a comprehensive approach? I think that, first of all, it's important to understand that if you want to achieve usable and transparent privacy, you can't just like check a list and think that you're done with it. I would say that it's a process and you have like an overarching principle, like typically privacy by design and by default. And you also have like a very concrete indication that, well, you can't just fully automate privacy decision because most of the time it goes against these uh, principles and legal requirements. And then you have this like blurry zone in between of like semi-automation that you actively have to think about. And what could be done like optimally would be to conduct user studies. Is it actually usable? Do people think that they uh, it improves their decision-making or not from the usability point of view? And also, if you want to like assert compliance, you would probably have to discuss it with a uh, DPO, with a data protection officer that will tell you whether you're, try, you're uh, actually complying with your uh, local uh, jurisdiction or not. But yeah, it's a complicated process. You actively have to think about every step. Also, every situation is different because in the IoT, you don't necessarily have like uh, interfaces with which you can provide information, and therefore make an de informed decision, unlike the web, because if you access the web, it's through a browser and you have like a big screen so you can actually know what's going on and therefore provide information. So like every case is different and you have to assess it. It's like security. You can't just like uh, check a list and, and think that you're done with it. It's, yeah, you have to, um, to reflect upon every step. Yeah, I would say it's discussed fully. Automating privacy decisions raises legal concerns, except for the decision to reject. Um, manual privacy decisions are in line with the GDPR, however, lead to usability issues because users do not have the mental capacity to make so many decisions and be well informed. So 
usability issues in turn lead to decisions that are not well informed and do not necessarily meet the user's preferences. So therefore, the middle way, semi-automation, is probably the, the best way to go. And yeah, to find suitable means for semi-automatically yeah, supporting privacy decisions while meeting legal requirements of the GDPR. And in our papers, we also provide some examples for such semi-automation. Excellent. Now, I know from your paper that your research is illustrative and you're going to be adding, as there's new technologies or, you know, you're going to be adding to the categorization so it's not exhaustive and that you have plans to do a next phase of this research, maybe around IoT. I'd love to learn more about what you have planned. Yeah, indeed, we plan to work on the IoT because that was initially the reason why we started this uh, this paper is because we want to build a privacy assistant for the IoT and specifically for a trigger action platform that use IoT devices. So trigger action platforms like uh, AFTT I mentioned before can like uh, connect every uh, devices and services, and so it's like a lo- it can be a lot of decision to make for a random person, even for like a knowledgeable persons, I would say. So the idea would be to build these privacy profiles according to like longitudinal study so that you will have your predefined profile, like your privacy pragmatic or privacy guardian, for instance. And according to that, you will have predefined choices about your privacy decisions. So it's always about like empowering people about like supporting their decision by providing like better and informed notices, for instance. And then we will combine it with another kind of automation with like on the fly privacy permission so that people are not burdened too much with the decisions, but only when needed, when required. Yeah, we were trying to like design it to solve this tension basically between usability and lawfulness in this kind of environment specifically this is basically the project for the upcoming year we will see how it goes and we have also another interesting uh, track because you said well it's not meant to be comprehensive but actually we're also trying to build a systematic literature review now about privacy decisions and the relation to automation we're starting to survey like over 100 uh, different papers related to like privacy permissions privacy preferences consent and reject and see what has been done in the past, whether they were accurate or not, whether they were using like machine learning, complex models, or like simple rules, which environments, what was the source of the data for the automation, how it was automated, et cetera, et cetera. So we're trying now to be uh, exhaustive in a way. And so it's still like a very um, preliminary work. We don't have much results, except that we interestingly found that many, many papers were drafted in the 2010s about recommendation system for uh, social networks. So it's not so novel what we're trying to achieve. So we're trying to do it in a different setting, which is novel in a way. But people have been trying to do that before. And they were not always successful, let's say. But yeah, this is like one of the main uh, funding that we have now about the comprehensiveness, let's say, of the study. Simone, if you want to add something. Yes, that was nicely summarized, Dave. I can also add that we conducted with further colleagues from Scheimers and Karlstadt also three focus groups to yeah, derive also qualitative research results about the user's preferences and concerns for IoT trigger action platforms. And the results will also allow us yeah, to implement a semi-automated approach for machine learning supported prediction of privacy preferences, where this of course has to be done in a privacy preserving manner, which can then be combined with on the fly privacy permission management. So an a semi-automated approach for asking user whether they want to revise the decisions in a context when they anyhow need to be asked to do the decisions. Thank you. So I know that you had done some research when it came to browsers and permissions and settings, and even we're taking a look at at Mozilla. 
Can you tell us a little bit about your work there and any calls to action? Yeah, yeah. Because when we started to uh, look at the, all the types of privacy decisions and we realized that uh, when it comes to consent, people have been trying to design tools to automate privacy decisions, sometimes in lawful ways. But not all the time, we, we found out that Mozilla was providing in its uh, better version a way to automate cookie banners management. So I do think that uh, Mozilla is trying to do a good job when it comes to privacy. So I don't want to bash them here. But we also found that they're providing a solution that will basically click on your behalf on, yes, I consent to cookie banners if they can't find the solution. And this goes against the GDPR requirements. So I tried to contact them, the legal team, notably try to help them out with this and so that they could go for the uh, the most privacy preserving solution. And unfortunately, they haven't answered yet. So if I could uh, like profit from this episode to reach out to Mozilla so that they can actually make the right choice and not go down the slippery slope, which will basically make this web browser click on Yes, I Consent on every type of cookie banners, that will be great. <laughs> right. Let's see if this platform can get you in front of someone at Mozilla who can answer the call. So I, I think that's a really noble goal. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks, thanks for sharing that. Do either of you have any last words of wisdom regarding this research? Anything you'd want to share with my audience of privacy engineers or any open source projects or conferences or anything? Just that usability for privacy is one of the most difficult areas to address. So we have very nice privacy enhancing technologies. The same holds for security, so they're a good security solution. But I think the major challenge are the human factors and how to make privacy usable. However, also, the GDPR requires usability, for instance, it's Article 12, because you can only achieve transparency and form decisions with usability. And I think our research hopefully contributes to this end, but there are still a lot of challenges remaining. So it's just a kind of first categorization and indications what directions to go, but still a lot of research needs to be done. So maybe that. It's my final word. Awesome. So if anybody is working on usability versus lawfulness research and wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to reach out to you both? Is it via LinkedIn? Should I just drop emails in the show notes? I think you put a link to our paper and there should be our emails, right? Yeah, email address. Uh, yeah, I, I stopped using LinkedIn because of uh, privacy <laughs> issues, let's say. <laughs> But we also keep the website of the project updated. So if you want to like um, stay informed about what we're doing in the CyberSec IT project, you can just uh, visit the uh, CyberSec IT website and you will have all of the links to our papers, which are always published in open access. And yeah, links to like uh, any kind of news. It's always going to be uh, on the website and the link I think will be provided in the description. You know, Simone and Victor, thank you so much for joining us today on Shifting Privacy Left. You know, we had a great discussion on the tension between usability and lawfulness and the automation of privacy decisions. So until next Tuesday, everyone, when we'll be back with engaging content and another great guest or guests. Thanks for joining us this week on Shifting Privacy Left. Make sure to visit our website, shiftingprivacyleft.com, where you can subscribe to updates so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found this episode valuable, go ahead and share it with a friend. And if you're an engineer who cares passionately about privacy, check out Privato, the developer-friendly privacy platform and sponsor of this show. To learn more, go to privato.ai. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday for a new episode. Bye for now.